practicing the biblical principles of what a church should be and manifesting the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Hour of Faith, originating from the sanctuary of the Faith Baptist Church of Altoona, Pennsylvania, 315 40th Street in the Highland Park section of the city. As you participate in today's broadcast, may the Lord challenge your heart with the Word. Welcome you to the Sunday morning service coming to you from the Faith Baptist Church of Altoona, Pennsylvania, the United States of America, and trust that uh, you're having a great day in the Lord. In fact, I trust that you've had a good Christmas and uh, now working on a good New Year's. Somebody told me this morning that 2019 is going to be a much better year. And you know what? We can pray for that, can't we? Uh, we've gone through 2018 and we've all had some struggles and some trials and some victories and some joys and some blessings and some other things probably. But 2019 is going to come and you know what? It could very well be that in 2019 Jesus would come again as well. And as a matter of fact today that's what my message is going to be. We have been spending four weeks talking about the incarnation of Christ, that is, the first advent of Jesus Christ into the world. And today, we're going to talk about the second coming of Christ, the second advent. And as we look back to the first coming of Christ and derive joy and peace and blessing from that, we ought to also look forward to the second coming of Christ and uh, draw from that joy and blessing and peace as well. So uh, that's what we're going to be talking about. But remember, Jesus could come in 2019. In fact, Jesus could come before we get finished with this service today. And so I trust that you know him. And that is our number one concern here at the Faith Baptist Church, that you know Christ. Uh, we, we say this often, but we, we trust that the Lord will use it in your life. That the Bible says we've all sinned and have come short to the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Which means to be delivered from sin, its power, its penalty, and its presence through faith in Jesus Christ the Lord. If you don't know the Lord, I would encourage you to call upon his name today and ask him to save you. And he will. And then contact us here and we will send you some information that will help you to get started right in your Christian life. And I've got a little assistant today who is going to tell you how to contact us. And uh, uh, Nora, what is our phone number? 814-944-2894. And can you repeat that? 814-944-2894. That's right, and it does work. And uh, you can get a hold of us through our website as well. And can you say that? www.fbcoutuna.org. Again? www.fbcoutuna.org. All right. And you hold that because I might ask you to say it again. You said three W's. Sometimes I get started and it's four or five. Do I get out of there? But um, we just want to uh, encourage you to keep one thing in mind as we look ahead. Uh, we here at the Faith Baptist Church of Altoona host the winter session of the Central Pennsylvania Bible Conference. 
And that's going to come up on the 2nd of February. Now, it's only one day. We meet at 10 o'clock in the morning, have lunch, which is a free lunch, and then we have a final session at 1 o'clock. And this year, our special speaker is going to be a real special speaker. It's going to be Steve Scheibner. Now, Steve Scheibner was the pilot who was to fly one of the planes that ultimately went into one of the buildings in New York City on 9-11-01. When he went to get ready to go get the plane or get in the plane, why, he found that he was bumped by a more senior pilot. And I'll tell you what, he's got a great testimony to share. He's also a pastor. He still flies, he's still a pilot, but he also pastors a church up in New England. And he's going to be with us for our Central Pennsylvania Bible Conference on February the 2nd at 10 in the morning, 1 in the afternoon, with a luncheon at 11.30. And uh, we're going to be having some special music. I'll tell you later on uh, who that will be. And then, of course, we're just going to have a great time. And I invite you to come on out and bring the entire family. So contact us if we can serve you in any way, spiritually speaking. And Nara... That telephone number again is what? 814-944-2894. And the web address is? www.fbcoutturner.org. All right. And uh, by the way, if you have a prayer request even now, go ahead and call it in and we'll pray for you. And if there's no one in the office, we just encourage you to give a, a voicemail and then we will be praying for you. And if we need to get back in touch with you, you will. Throughout the month of December, the Christmas season this year, our theme song has been Born to Die because that was our theme for the uh, month of December. We're going to sing it one last time during this season. It's number 102 in our hymn book, and I invite you all to stand as we sing, and those of you joining us by Media Ministries, sing it with us as well, Born to Die.
calling. still recall the day that I was chosen as a soldier in the army of the Lord, all suited in my armor with a special sword beside me, fashioned by the Spirit and the Word. It wasn't long until I faced the adversary. A surprising blow took me to my knees. When a young and fighting warrior found strength to rise for battle, remembering the word given to me, Expect to win, expect the victory. We have never been defeated or considered to retreat. Lift up your heads, for your redemption is nigh to thee. Expect to win, expect the victory. Mount Calvary, the Son of God Almighty, faced a conflict that he alone could win. It was there he met the master of all evil in a battle that would change the course of men. Many standing there who watched the Savior dying in disbelief thought it would be the end. But as he cried, it's finished, Satan's kingdom was defeated, overthrown to never rise again. Expect to Expect the victory. We have never been defeated or considered to retreat. Lift up your heads, for your redemption is nigh to thee. Expect to win. Expect the victory. How to be a soldier raised up to stand led by the captain of our souls equipped to be a conqueror enlisted to the end the mission for this time so long ago expect to win Expect the victory. We have never been defeated or considered to retreat. Expect to win. Expect the victory. We have never been defeated or considered to retreat. Lift up your heads. For your redemption is nigh to thee. Expect to win. Expect the victory. Expect to win. Expect the victory. Expect to win. Expect the victory. Amen and amen. And that's right, because the Bible tells us that 
We are more than conquerors, more than conquerors to him that loved us in Christ Jesus. And so expect to win. Expect the victory. If you have a copy of God's Word, please turn with me this morning to the book of Acts, chapter 1. The first uh, chapter of the book of Acts. Today we're going to be delivering a message entitled, Consider the Second Coming of Christ. Consider the second coming of Christ from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. And I would invite you under the respect of God's word to please stand as I read and you follow along. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. And there we find the word of God says, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. And by the way, that's a reference to the book of Luke. Until the day in which he was taken up after that, he threw the Holy Ghost and had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of them pertaining to the kingdom thing, pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem but wait for the promise of the father which saith he ye have heard of me for John truly baptized with water but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence when they therefore were come together they ask of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And the cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And that 11th verse is going to be our key verse today. Every time I read that, it's, it's like the Lord Jesus was saying to his disciples, don't just stand here, go do something. And I thought that would be a good title to a message. But notice what he says or what the angel says, excuse me. The angel said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. What a verse of scripture that is. And as I look at that particular verse of scripture, I see four things, and these four things are not going to be my points of outline today but you look at that particular verse we have hope in that verse the hope which is the assurance and the reality that Jesus is coming again we've got comfort in the midst of the difficulties of knowing that Jesus is coming again we have an admonition to be ready for his coming because it could be at any time and then we've got encouragement oh don't give up Jesus could come again today so those are four great words of encouragement, hope, comfort, admonition, and encouragement. But we're going to look at it in a little bit different light today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we come to you this morning, we thank you and praise you once again for the great God that you are. Thank you for this comforting fact that Jesus is coming again. And we derive hope and comfort and admonition and encouragement from that and we say, Amen, even so come, Lord Jesus. Now, Father, I pray that you will guide us in our preaching today, guide us in our hearing today, 
And may we apply these words to our heart as you give them to us by your Holy Spirit. And I pray if there's one today who does not know Christ, that today would be the time of salvation for them, but also strengthen and encourage the believer. And we will give you the praise and the thanksgiving for it all. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, for the past several weeks, we have been talking about the first advent of our Lord Jesus Christ into this world. We've been talking about the first coming of Christ. We've been talking about the incarnation of Christ. And as we look back upon that first advent and the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ, it does give us great joy. And keep in mind that when the angels spoke to the shepherds, they said that they were bringing good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. And when we look back to the incarnation of Jesus Christ, it does give us great joy, doesn't it? Because we realize that through Jesus Christ, we have life eternal and life abundant. But today, we're going to look at the second advent of Christ, the second coming of Jesus Christ. And as the first advent has brought us joy, that second advent should bring us joy as well. We have joy looking back at what Jesus Christ did for us in the past, in the incarnation. But now, we can have joy looking forward to what Jesus Christ is going to do for us in the future. When we hear the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and Jesus will say, come up hither. And I remind you, that could happen today. That could happen today. Can you say that with me? That could happen today. And I'm going to give the invitation right now before we go any further. Because if that happens and you don't know the Lord, you will stay on this earth and go through the great tribulation period, a time that the world's never known. And you will be on your way to a Christless eternity in the lake of fire. So don't wait. Call upon the name of the Lord. Right now, in your own heart, simply say, Lord Jesus, I trust you to save me. And he will. Make that decision today. But we look forward to the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with joy. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And as I think of the second coming of Christ, and particularly as I look at this particular verse of uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse 11, that promises us hope and comfort and admonition and encouragement, I'd like to preach to you all day. Do we have to go home? I mean, uh, you know, I realize that we've got 35 minutes and 45 seconds left in this mini media ministry, but we could stay all day and talk about the second coming of Christ, couldn't we? Wouldn't that be great? Well, don't worry, we won't. But there's so much to say about the second coming of Christ, and we just want to touch on a couple of things today to get our heart focused on the fact that any time Jesus could come again. And it could be today. I want us to begin, first of all, by looking at the promise of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And you know, the second coming of Jesus Christ is mentioned at least 329 times in the Word of God. Now think about that. If something is mentioned once in the Word of God, it's pretty important, isn't it? Isn't it? Hello, are you awake today? If something is mentioned once in the Word of God, it's pretty important, isn't it? If it's mentioned 329 times, what is that teaching us? It's teaching us that God wants us to know something about it because it is very, very important. And the doctrine of the second coming of Christ is spoken of in both, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. In fact, one of the clearest passages of Scripture on the, first, on the second coming of Christ in the Old Testament is in Zechariah chapter 14. We're not going to turn back there today, but you can look at that later because it speaks of the time when Jesus Christ is going to come and, and land on the, the Mount of Olives there just east of Jerusalem. And that, of course, will be the beginning of his great reign on earth. What a passage of Scripture that is. What I want us to do today, though, is just to focus a little bit on this first point, on the promise of the second coming of Christ. And see what Jesus has to say about it. Yes, we could look at 
many passages in the Word of God. We could expound on this passage before us. Acts chapter 1 and verse 11. As the angels said, this same Jesus which is taken uh, up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye see him going into heaven. We could look at that. And I, I've got to tell you that I am tempted to do it. But I want us to focus a little bit on the words of Jesus Christ and the promise that he gives concerning his second coming. So turn with me back to a very, very familiar passage of scripture, which is John chapter 14, if you would please. John, the 14th chapter, and we know this as being a part of the Olivet Discourse. The Lord Jesus Christ is preparing his disciples for the fact that he is going to believing, but he speaks concerning the, the second coming of Christ. And as he teaches on the second coming of Christ here, he gives a threefold purpose for the second coming of Christ. Notice, first of all, he says, as we anticipate the second coming of Christ, we should do so so as to avoid a troubled heart. To avoid a troubled heart. Notice verse 1 of John 14. Jesus, speaking to his disciples, says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Now keep in mind that in just a few hours, Jesus is going to go to the cross. And on that cross, he's going to suffer and bleed and die for the sins of the world. But in the midst of that, he was saying to his disciples, don't be troubled. Not only that, but if we look back in the previous chapter, chapter 13, we find that back there, Jesus was saying to the disciples, I'm going to leave you. You see me now, but soon you will see me no more. He was also telling them, as he said many times, that in this world they're going to have tribulation and that people will hate them and even attempt to kill them because they hate Jesus. And so you see, they, they were having a troubled heart, these disciples were. And Jesus was saying, don't have a troubled heart. The best is yet to come. And you know something? That is a great encouragement to each and every one of us today. One of the things that encouraged the early church to keep on keeping on in the midst of great persecution was anticipating the fact that Jesus would come at any time. And today as we go through difficulties, whatever those difficulties may be, James chapter uh, 5 and verses 7 and 8 tells us to be patient because the coming of the Lord draws nigh, which means that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ could happen at any moment, at any moment. And so whatever it is you're going through, whatever it is you are facing in life, remember something, that Jesus could come at any moment and take you out of that difficulty if you know him as your personal Savior. So uh, thinking about the second coming of Christ helps us to avoid a troubled heart. The second thing that Jesus teaches here is that as we consider the second coming of Christ, it's given to anticipate an eternal home, an eternal home in the presence of God, in heaven, in a land without tears, a time without end. Look at verses 2 and 3. Jesus says, in my Father's house are many mansions, literally many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That's a promise. Right now, Jesus is up in heaven preparing a place for us. Now, I don't know all the uh, idiosyncrasies of this, but, but God, God spoke the whole universe in creation in six days. For 2,000 years, Jesus has been preparing a place for us in heaven. That's going to be some place. And are you looking forward to it? It's going to be a beautiful place. No shoveling of snow. No mowing grass. No cleaning leaves out of gutters. Whatever. It's just going to be the place that Christ himself has prepared for us because he loves us. 
And he says in verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Say that with me. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. You see, Jesus is not only providing an eternal home for us in heaven to spend with him, but he's providing an eternal home for us in heaven that we might enjoy fellowship with him. Yes, he wants to give us a beautiful place to live for all of eternity. But he wants to fellowship with us. And, and, and the Bible teaches us that when we get into that yonder place, that he will be our God. We will be his people. And there will be a very intimate relationship with him. And so you see, Jesus is speaking on the second coming, not only, only to avoid a troubled heart, but to anticipate a future eternal home. But then... As we continue to look at this passage, he teaches on the second coming to announce the way to be ready for his second coming. Uh, Verses uh, 4 and 5 goes on where Jesus says, And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas, remember Thomas was that doubting disciple. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Look what Jesus said to him. Oh, just look at this this morning. Jesus said to Thomas and to the rest of the disciples and to you and me, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the way without whom there is no going. He is the truth without whom there is no knowing. He is the life without whom there is no living. And the fact of the matter is, Jesus Christ came to this earth the first time, not to go to the manger, but to go to the cross to provide an eternal home for us. That is, those of us who know him through faith in him. I ask you today, Do you know Jesus Christ as Savior? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Are you truly born again? Well, I trust that you are. And if you're not, call upon the name of the Lord today and ask him to save you. Jesus here was predicting his second coming. And you know, I've got to say this, that every promise that was given concerning the first coming of Jesus Christ was fulfilled to the exact T. And if every promise that was given concerning the first coming of Christ was fulfilled to the exact T, we can also believe that every promise concerning the second coming of Christ will be fulfilled to the exact T as well. Can't we? He is coming again. He's promised it. Is he a liar? No. Can anybody prevent him from coming again when it's time? No. He said it. He'll do it. We can anticipate it. I hope you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. But that leads us to a second point, which is the purpose of the second coming of Christ. Why is Christ coming again? Well, I mentioned a moment ago that that I could spend a lot of time on the second coming of Christ today. And as it relates to this particular point, I could spend hours, maybe days, maybe weeks on this in a series. But I just want to highlight a couple of things for you as we consider what this great second coming of Christ is going to to be. What is the purpose? Why is he coming again? Well, the first and the foremost reason is to take believers into his presence. You know very well, I'm sure that many of you anyway, know very well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. We're not going to turn there. You might want to turn to that later. But that is one of the passages in the Word of God where the rapture is spoken of. And it tells us that there's going to come a time when we will hear the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And Jesus Christ shall shout, probably saying what it says there in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, Come up hither. Those who are alive and remain will be caught up together with those who will come out of the grave first. In other words, those who have died and gone on before us, will come out of the grave first. Those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And you know what? We say, Amen, even so come, Lord Jesus. Imagine if you were walking through a cemetery on the day of the rapture. Hopefully, 
there would be a traffic jam. So many people coming forth out of that grave, those graves. I don't know. But you see, it's going to happen. And somebody asked me once, how long is that meeting going to be in the air? I mean, we're going to meet those who've gone on before us. Our moms and our dads and our grandparents and our loved ones and our friends. And we're going to meet Jesus. How, have you ever stopped to ask the question, how long is that meeting in the air going to be? You know how long it is? I don't know. Because I know that once that meeting is done, we're going to go to be with the Lord in heaven. I think the Lord's just going to give us the time to greet each other and then say, here we go. And that passage of scripture ends by saying, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Jesus is coming again. And one of the purposes is to take us into his presence. Another one of the purposes of the second coming of Christ is to unlock other future events. Now, there are many events that the second coming of Christ will unlock. We, again, don't have the time to, to, to dig into those. Allow me just to mention a few. First of all, there will be the unlocking of the Great Tribulation period. And as I've already mentioned, that is going to be a time of trouble on the earth such as the earth has never, ever known. It's going to be a seven-year period. There will be 21 significant judgments within that particular period. And the purpose of that period will be, number one, to prepare Israel for Christ's literal coming to the earth after the tribulation so that they will accept him as their Messiah. And it will also be to judge the earthlings, that is, those who are on the earth. It will be a time of terrible trouble under the reigning of the Antichrist. It's the rapture that unlocks that. Another thing that the rapture unlocks is the specific judgments of God. Now, yes, I said that in the tribulation period, there are going to be 21 judgments under the seals and the, the vials and, and the trumpet judgments. But there are some other judgments that will take place as well. First of all, there will be the Bema seat judgment. That's the judgment seat of Christ. That's where those of us as Christians will stand before the Lord and receive our rewards for serving him. That's when I hope that we will all be able to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, because we've been faithfully serving him. There will be no unsaved people there. But every Christian will be there. And at that particular point, we will be rewarded for our life of ministry. The sin issue won't be dealt with there. The sin issue has already been dealt with back yonder in the cross. But what will take place there will be our rewards standing before God. And there will be five rewards given to us for faithful servants. Oh, I trust that we'll all receive those rewards. And hearing our Lord say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. No unsaved people will be there. But later on, after the tribulation is over and after the millennium is over, then there will be another judgment called the great white throne judgment. And no saved people will be there. Only unsaved people will be there. And because their names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, they will be cast into the eternal lake of fire. How sad. Because, you see, there will be people who will, on that day, stand before the Lord Jesus and they'll say, I've done this in your name and I've done that in your name and I've done many great and wonderful works. But because they didn't trust Christ as Savior, he'll look at them and will say, depart from me. I've never known you. I've never known you. How sad will that be? People are thinking they're going to heaven but they'll spend eternity in hell because they never trusted Christ as Savior. Another thing that the rapture will unlock will be the millennium. That's the 1,000-year reign of Christ on earth. And so you see, the first thing that takes place after we are raptured and taken up to meet the Lord in the air will be the tribulation, seven-year period of time on the earth of trouble. Then, at the end of the tribulation, Jesus will literally come to the earth to the Mount of Olives, as Zechariah 14 speaks of. And at that point, after the Battle of Armageddon, then we see that Jesus is going to set up his 1,000-year reign on earth. That's going to be a perfect kingdom. 
Just read through the book of Isaiah. You'll be, you, you, you'll be ready to go to the millennium. Because in the book of the Isaiah, it talks about a perfect time. When there's going to be no trouble. When there's going to be a time of peace forevermore in that period. Because Jesus will be in charge. Perfect judgment. Perfect justice. Perfect government. The Democrats and the Republicans won't be having a hard time getting together then because maybe they won't be there. I don't know. But there will be no political party. Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, will rule and reign. And it's the second coming of Christ that unlocks that. Another thing that the second coming of Christ will unlock will be the destruction of Satan. How many of you enjoy fighting Satan every day? None of us do. That old guy, you know, he, he's around us all the time trying to disrupt us in our walk with the Lord, isn't he? Well, you know, he was defeated on the cross. He was cast out of heaven back yonder when he fell. And in, in Genesis 3.15, it was promised to him that he would be destroyed. On the cross, Jesus Christ ultimately judged him. And one of these days, he's going to be cast into the eternal lake of fire forever and ever with the Antichrist and the false prophet and all those who do not know Christ. Satan will be destroyed. And then, and there's a lot of things I could bring. But just a final thing that I want to bring out that the second coming will unleash, unlock, and that is the eternal state in heaven. Revelation chapters 21 and 22. A land without tears, time without end where we'll be able to fellowship with God without any hindrance at all. That new Jerusalem, 1,500 miles cubed. That's a big city. And, 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 and then the whole universe that goes along with that. And we'll, we'll just know the joy of the Lord for all of eternity. How many of you are looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ? I know I am. And remember, that first stage being the rapture could be today. I mean, we could go on and on. I do want to mention one other thing. As we look at the purpose of the second coming of Christ, it's, it's, it's going to take believers into the presence of God. It's going to unlock other future events. But it will also pour out God's wrath. I don't want to miss that. It's going to pour out the wrath of God. And I've, I've spoken of this already, that after the rapture, after Christians are caught up to be with the Lord in the air, the unsaved will stay here on the earth, go into that tribulation period, and it's going to be a terrible, terrible time. Just by way of passing, turn with me to Revelation chapter 6. I want you to see how bad it's going to be. Revelation the sixth chapter gives us somewhat of an insight as to what that great tribulation is going to be like. Revelation chapter 6, beginning with verse 15, <clears throat> says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. They were trying to hide from God. It says, For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? If you don't know Jesus, and the rapture happens today, then today... You'll be on your way into the great tribulation period when people will be crying for the mountains to fall on them so that they might die. But that won't happen. They'll go through that terrible time. And then, at the end of the millennium, when that great white throne judgment takes place, God's wrath will be poured out upon all unbelievers. You're already in Revelation. Go to the book of Revelation chapter 20. And I would encourage you to read that entire passage. That is verses 10 through 15. We don't have the time to do it today. But notice 
It says in Revelation chapter 20, verses 14 and 15, Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, which means eternal separation from God. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, that is God's record of born-again believers, was cast into the lake of fire. Now, if you don't know Jesus, when the first stage of the second coming occurs, you will go into the great tribulation period, a time of wrath such as the world has never known. But eventually, you'll go into the eternal wrath of God in the lake of fire with the devil, the beast, that is the Antichrist, the false prophet, all of the devil's demons, It's not going to be a good place when you take into consideration that if you'd have just trusted Christ, you would be on your way to heaven. Do you know the Lord? We've already talked about the promise of the second coming of Christ and the purpose of the second coming of Christ. And some of you might say, is it really going to happen? Well, just remember Jeremiah chapter 51 and verse 29. Look at it later. Jeremiah chapter 51 and verse 29 says, Every purpose of the Lord shall be performed. Every purpose of the Lord shall be performed. Everything that God purposes to do, He will do, and nothing will stop Him. The third point that I share with you is the presentation of the second coming of Christ. And, you know, as we study the Word of God, we find that the second coming of Christ is mentioned many, many times over and again. I I, I mentioned that at least 329 times the Bible speaks of the second coming of Christ. We know that in the New Testament that 23 of the 27 books of the New Testament speaks of the second coming of Christ. All nine human authors of the New Testament speaks of the second coming of Christ. One out of every 30 verses in the New Testament speaks of the second coming of Christ. And of the 318 chapters that are in the New Testament, 216 of them speak of the second coming of Christ. That means it's pretty significant, doesn't it? That means that the Lord wants us to know about it, don't you think? And, you know, we could, we could give a survey as to how that's mentioned in the Gospels and in the Pauline epistles where Paul himself speaks of it 50 times. And we could see how it's, it, it's brought out for us in the great book of the Revelation. But we are already in Revelation. Turn, if you would please, to Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12. And notice what Jesus says. If you have a red print Bible, red letter edition, you see it's in red letters, right? That means Jesus is speaking. And he says, and behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me. To give every man, that is every woman, every man, every human being, every person, according to as his work shall be. That word quickly doesn't mean in a short period of time. In other words, Jesus said that about 2,000 years ago. You study that word quickly through on your own. It doesn't mean that in the next five minutes Jesus is coming. What it means is that when Christ comes, it's going to be very rapid. Just be like that. The rapture will happen in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. When Jesus comes down to the earth there in in Zechariah 14, that's going to be quick. He's going to come quick and, and his reward will be with him. What will his reward be? This is not talking about the reward of, of, that we'll be receiving as Christians because of faithful work. There are five crowns uh, that we will be receiving because of our faithful service. That's not what that's talking about there. That reward with him is going to be him. Did you hear that? The reward of the second coming of Christ will be Christ's presence. What is this doing to you today? Is it doing anything? The fact that at any moment Jesus could come in the rapture and we will see him face to face and spend eternity with him? 
You see, that leads us to the final point, which is the preparation for the second coming of Christ. How can we today be prepared for that first stage, which is the rapture? Because that could happen before this service ends. How can we be prepared? First of all, by knowing Jesus Christ as Savior. Do you know him? Because you see, if you don't know him, as I've emphasized several times already, it's not going to be good. You'll be under God's wrath. You go over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. It says in verse 7 and following, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. That, if you're not saved, that ought to scare your socks off of you this morning. I'm serious. Because when Jesus comes again, if you're not ready, you will be under God's wrath. So the first thing you need to do is to make sure you know Christ today. Do you know the Savior? The second thing is this. Make sure you're serving him. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, we are told that that when Jesus Christ comes again, we are going to to receive these rewards. I've been talking about them. But in verse 10 of 2 Corinthians 5, it says, For we must all appear, that's Christians now, all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or what? Bad. What kind of reward will you receive? If you're not serving him, the rewards will be rare. If you are just going about life, not focusing on the Lord, but filled with wood, hay, stubble, well then, you'll not receive reward. But if you've got gold, silver, and precious stone, that is really serving the Lord to his glory, then when you see him, he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So number one, make sure you know the Lord in his preparation. Number two, make sure you're serving the Lord. And then number three, make sure you love the Lord. You know there's a special reward given to those who love him at the second coming. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. The Apostle Paul is giving his final Final testimony. And he says this. He says, verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Now look at verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. One of the the rewards that's given. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only. Let's read that rest of that verse together but unto all them that love his appearing when you think of the second coming of Christ does that give you blessing do you love it are you looking forward to it if you know that somebody's going to come and visit you that you love you can't wait till they show up right Somebody who loves you more than anybody else has ever loved you is Jesus Christ. And if you are saved, one of these days he's going to come. Are you looking forward to that with love? It's interesting what Paul says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 22. That those who do not love the Lord Jesus Christ, second coming, are anathema. That means cursed. So, you know, look at that yourself later on. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 22. If you're under the sound of my voice today and you don't love the second coming of Christ, it means that you don't know the Lord. It means that you are on your way to the wrath of God. It means that today you need to trust Christ as Savior. And then serve him. And then love him. I trust you're prepared for the second coming of Christ because you know the Lord. That first stage could happen today. 
when the last person who is to be saved calls upon the name of the Lord. As Christians, we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord today. Wouldn't it be great to be the person who leads that last person who's going to be saved to the Lord? And as soon as that person says yes to Christ, whew, here we come, Jesus. We're on our way up. Hallelujah. Every now and then people say, I can't wait for the second coming of Christ. Do you know what will enhance the second coming of Christ? Our soul winning. Because God is not willing that any should perish. He's waiting for us to get out there and we win people to Christ. And as we are involved with evangelism, that will enhance the rapture of the church when Christ comes for us. The first stage of the second coming of Christ could occur now. No prophecy must be fulfilled before the rapture. So make certain that you're ready for the rapture. Are you ready? If the rapture would have happened last night, where would you be today? Do you know you'd be in heaven for sure? If you have any doubts about it, then I encourage you right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I trust you to save me, and he will. Then let us know. We'll give you information to help you get started right in your Christian life. But don't leave this church building and don't turn off this program until you've said, Lord Jesus, I trust you to save me. That eternal life might be yours. And then anticipate the voice of the archangel. First coming of Christ was great and brought a lot of joy, didn't it? Second coming of Christ is going to be greater and will bring a lot more joy because we will see him face to face. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's stand for prayer. Father in heaven, as we come to you this morning, I pray that you'll take this this message and use it for your glory in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to conclude by singing number 348. My hope is in the Lord. It's not in the, the government, not in the church. It's in the Lord. If you have a spiritual need, you come. And if you're joining us by media ministry, you contact us. We'd be delighted to help you in your walk with the Lord as we sing number 348. Thank you for your participation in our worldwide broadcast of the Hour of Faith, which originated from the sanctuary of the Faith Baptist Church of Altoona, Pennsylvania, 315 40th Street in the Highland Park section of the city. Dr. Gary G. Dole and the Family of Faith welcomes you to Sunday school at 9.30, morning worship at 10.30, Sunday night service at 6 with youth programs, adult prayer and Bible study, Wednesdays at 7 with Foundations for Faith every Wednesday night during the school year. If we may ever be of any spiritual help to you, please call 814-944-2894. Log on to our website at www.fbcaltuna.org or write to The Faith Baptist Church, 31540 Street, Altoona, Pennsylvania, 16602, USA. I'm JT Teeter. Till the next time we meet, may the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.